Hello and welcome to Record of the Day. I'm joined today with the incredible Gordon Al, all the way live from New York. Ooh, ooh. Uh, Gordon is, is an amazing trumpet player, uh, a, a band leader, a ranger, um, also known for your great sartorial collection. Um, I, I'm you. a big fan of your suits and, and, and combinations that you put on Instagram. Um, I know you lead the, the Grand Street Stompers and I guess you half lead the Owl Brothers band. Yeah, it's a, it's a collectively led <laughs> enterprise, but yes. <laughs> uh, so, so you have a, another brother who plays also trumpet, right? Yeah, so two younger brothers and Justin, oh, two younger Justin brothers. Al okay. yeah, is a trumpet player. Brandon Al is a trombone player. Also in that band is our, is our uncle, Howard Miata, who plays tuba in that band. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, I've met your brother, Justin, before once playing trumpet in Denver, I think. Oh, great. Yeah, um, yeah but it, so were you all playing growing up all together or was it like, but like I, I, were, was there a family band at the beginning, I guess is my question. To, um, so not really, not really a regularly performing bands with, sure. the, with the one exception being Every, every Christmas, probably for t over two decades, I'd have to think about that. Possibly close to three decades. We've we've done like a Christmas family brass band. Oh, cool! And that's always been those four of us. Plus, you know, we have we have I have another uh, uncle who is a retired band director. Plus, oh, wow. an aunt who was a music teacher. Another aunt who was a like a classical musician. So you were um, really doomed <laughs> to this lifestyle. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, there were a lot of factors that, that pushed me towards and against uh, taking a career in music, but, uh, yeah, but, but you know, um, ultimately it was just my own foolishness. <laughs> or, I, we'll, we'll call it passion here, uh, <laughs> rather than <laughs> foolishness. Um, so well, I, I think they go hand in hand a little bit. <laughs> um, so t this is kind of a two-part question, but uh, one, why trumpet? Was it your first choice or did you just kind of end up with it or uh -huh. whatever? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so my, so that uncle of mine, um, Howard, he, uh, the tuba he player. plays, yes, a tuba okay. player. He also plays trombone and kind of in a, uh, in a growly, like Lou Waters, Turk Murphy kind of oh, style. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Super and he cool. plays, uh, he's played for years in a jazz band that just, uh, just recently retired called the High Sierra Jazz Band. But when I was young, I came up listening to their records and cassettes oh, cool. and, uh, and got that trad sound in my head. Um, and then he was the first one who, uh, who gave me a horn, a, a cornet on another Christmas. And I, <laughs> and I think basically through his influence, it was already predetermined that, you know, we must play a brass instrument. But then I think I myself chose chose the trumpet uh, I think because I don't I don't know why exactly. Sorry. Were you the first? In, yes, in, I'm the oldest of so the, you were the sons there. So then your younger brother picked up trumpet. Was it kind of like a stab in the back or was it flattering <laughs> or? Well, again, you know, it would have diversified the family band if, if he'd got, <laughs> gone with like reeds or a rhythm section. Um, <laughs> No, but it was fine. Also, you know, between uh, between Justin and I, it's a seven year separation. So. Oh wow. Okay. You know, we were we were never really playing at school together or things like that. Got but it. Brandon and I did a little bit. Yeah. I I've got a six years older brother, and I uh, played trombone in band because he played trombone in band. And then the first drums I ever played were the drums he left in the basement. So <laughs> I, I I get that kind of following in your brother's example way. That's cool. Right. Um, so the, the record you picked today uh, has a lot to do with a project you recently did, which is the <laughs> Lewis Armstrong All-Stars project. And this is uh, technically a little bit before it, but it's... Uh, just before, yeah. Just before. So it's Lewis Armstrong with Edmund Hall's All-Stars. Uh, and Edmund Hall was the clarinetist in the Lewis Armstrong All-Stars, right? Eventually. Eventually, so, okay. Um, so this, so this concert, I believe, this record we're going to check out is from February, right? February 47? I believe that's correct. Yeah, February 8th, <clears throat> 1947. At Carnegie and Hall. The, right, yes. Whereas the, um, 
what's what's regarded as kind of the the, the formal debut of Lewis's All Stars was in May, and that okay. was with that was with Peanuts Hucko on oh, clarinet yeah. the debut concert at Town Hall, also in New York. Um, but Edmund Edmund Hall, I think, officially joined the All Stars around fifty five. Even okay, so a few years later. A few times. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, you are the expert here. So anything I say, just take with a grain of salt. <laughs> you've done all the research here. Um, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start it off with, with, uh, with a side one, and we're going to start with Dipper Mouth Blues. Great. A King Oliver classic. Ooh. And starts right there with Edmund Hall. Or Louis Armstrong. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Okay, so I have one question about this song. Yeah. It's also known as Sugarfoot Stomp. Do you know why? So I believe that Sugarfoot was a renaming of the tune by Fletcher Henderson when he mm. created his, his okay. orchestra version of it. Um, so the original is from, I think, 23, and it was around 25 that uh, Lewis recorded it with, with Fletcher under that different title. I'm not sure if that was somehow a copyright avoidance thing or... Um... Okay, I hadn't considered that. I just, I, this is one of the things I always appreciate about Louis Armstrong, and maybe you can talk about it, because I feel like I never get tired of listening to the same songs and he never got tired of playing the same songs over and over again. He was, he was very consistent, yeah. There were songs he played for throughout his entire career. I guess I shouldn't say maybe he never got tired of them because I don't know that, but he kept playing them. There's, um... Okay, hold on a second. Sure. That was a fairly close harken back, harkening back to the to the Lewis's original solo on this, of course. Right. No. And King Oliver is playing as well. Yeah. Um. Yes. Back a, a, many years ago, down in New Orleans, uh, Amy Johnson tried to do a, a showcase choreography all with live music. And I was smart enough to pick that song and ask Ben Pulser if he knew that solo. And he said, of course I know that. <laughs> and so he didn't have to learn anything. And he played it note for note. And it was perfect for our routine. Great. Uh, this is Mahogany Hall Stomp, by the way. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and read off who's on this record. Uh, we have Louis Armstrong on trumpet and vocals, Edmund Hall on clarinet. Uh, I'll let you comment on this after I get through, but Irving Mouse Randolph on trumpet. Uh, Henderson Chambers trombone, Ellis Larkins on piano, Johnny Williams bass, and Jimmy Crawford drums. Uh, you mentioned a comment about Irving Mouse Randolph before. Yeah, just that I had read in in some sources that that his nickname was either Mouse or Mousy. I'm, I'm sure it's of course extremely possible that both were applied. Right. And I, d I don't really know. Uh, uh, these personnel, although I know Henderson Chambers played um, with Lewis's orchestra in like the early 40s. Oh, cool. On trombone. Um, yes. There, there's not a lot on the back of this record. It's a little brief history of Edmund Hall. The one comment about this recording that it has, uh, and it has no, there, no one says who wrote it, uh, but they thought it was particularly good to have some of Chambers' gutty trombone since there's so little of it on record. So apparently he didn't get around much, but uh, this is one of those recordings where he really lets loose on, according to this mystery person who <laughs> wrote on the record. Yeah. I'm liking the, I'm liking the vibe so far. I, I guess I have, we haven't heard that much of like freehorn ensemble things where it just might be a balance thing with Lewis being way at the forefront. That's very true. Um, 
but it'd be but it'd be good to hear some of the three horn together to see how yeah how Henderson adds to that. So you do uh, you, you do a lot of that kind of um, I, I think of it as a New Orleans thing, kind of that collective improv layered horn stuff. And yeah. What I didn't realize until I was getting ready for this earlier is that I didn't realize you actually lived and studied in New Orleans for a while. Yeah, yeah, I was there for uh, for like two and a half years. Cool. Uh, that, that's where I was before coming to New York. I was okay. there primarily doing this master's fellowship for the Monk Institute, which is a super modern jazz uh, program. But nice. uh, but yeah, I'd been playing, uh, you know, New Orleans or traditional jazz is the first jazz that I started playing. Okay. Around around middle school it was. Nice. Uh, this next tune, of course, being the Muskrat Ramble, the the, the classic of. Cla- I feel like this is one of those tunes that was never new. <laughs> it was always old. <laughs> yeah, it's. I think you know this one is. Technically, it's uh, it's Kid Ori's song, but of course, he might have taken elements of it from from other pre-existing compositions. Oh, I cool. think that that almost certainly applies to. Uh, uh, what was the other tune this uh, this on this record looks like that? Anyway, a, a few others um, also Ooh. fall into that category. I, I've gotten into a couple debates about that particular rhythm and whether it's a, a straight or kind of a Charleston rhythm. Right. And I, I I think actually maybe you commented on one, and now they've done both. <laughs> yeah, like right there. Yeah. Yeah. So on. Um, where was it on um, yeah so what they've done just just right here like using it in the charleston rhythm as a send-off for a soloist lewis was in the habit of doing that okay cool he did that on uh let's see where was it uh maybe it was with the lewis armstrong and dixieland seven in 1946 well he okay. covered that and did the same thing oh nice oh i i'll tell you what I, I love talking to the people who are experts about the people we're listening to, because I ask you questions and you give so much wonderful information to go listen to later, and now I have so much homework. Uh, if I happen to know it, yeah. Well, you know more than me, certainly, about Louis Armstrong. Um, and I'm going to ask you a really simple question, if I can. Yeah. He's playing his own... Uh, I get distracted. <laughs> He's so, his attack is so crisp. Uh, was that the end? If the... Uh, apparently that's the end of Muskrat Ramble. Oh. Huh, I, I, that's... I, I'm wondering that's interesting. if maybe what the, the medium they were recording on ran out in the middle of the song. And they, yeah. which in time, I don't know. Well, that's a bummer. Or the trombone tag didn't work out for some reason. I, I don't guess. see why that could have happened, but yeah. Okay. Uh, well, this is on the St. Louis Blues. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think this whole I think this whole record is a little bit sharp. I'm not sure how much. In, in, in pitch, you mean? Yes. Yeah. So you. I don't hear that at all, because I just hear that it's in tune with itself, but you can hear that it's not quite, like a B-flat is actually closer to a B. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's almost a half step or not. I think it's, it's still closest to the correct pitch, but uh, you know as a, as a trumpet player yourself <laughs> how important it is to know, uh, <laughs> you know to, to hear the pitch before you play it, so I've really internalized at least for the trumpet, the correct pitches. That's, I, I'm, yeah, as a trumpet player myself, not at all. But I have started to understand what you mean because your instrument is really hard. It, it is, it is very difficult, yeah. Um, oof, oh. And just spending like 30 minutes a day in quarantine on trumpet has made me realize how much harder it is than I thought it was. Because even playing trombone for years, I thought I understood trumpet, and no, I, I, it's a totally different animal. Right. 
that's a really nice backing riff. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah Edmund's Edmund Hall is a great, you know, obviously a great soloist, but he was a, he was a wonderful second player too. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I you I bought this actually kind of on a. It was in a $3 bin, and it had Louis Armstrong and Carnegie Hall on it, so I figured, why not? And I yeah. actually, I didn't know much about Edmund Hall or Edmund Hall's All-Stars, and the, the one thing I've learned from the back of this is, uh, apparently when Teddy Wilson left his sextet, uh, Edmund Hall took it over. So this is kind of the, I think this is the leftover band of the Teddy Wilson sextet in some form. Oh, yeah, yeah, could be. Um, because it said he took it over around 45 or 46. So a, a year or two later, I'm sure there were some substitutions. But um, So a lot of these guys were playing with Teddy before that. I know yeah. Jimmy Crawford on drums was. Uh, I love this tune. Uh, this is Rock and Chair. You, of course, know, but for the people. Um, I know this most as a duet with Jack Teagarden that yeah. Lewis would do later. Yeah, which is classic. So, so I wonder if... They did it a hundred times. So is this not a duet on this album? I think it is. Oh. Old rock and chip got to follow. Uh, king by my side. You know who <laughs> it is? By your side. Yeah, who, who is that? Uh, fetch me some gin, huh? They don't credit anyone I've else on got vocals. I've no for the Oh, I'll stand your hat. My guess would be Ed, Ed, Edmund Hall or Henderson Chambers, but who knows? Well, I think is that I think that's Edmund playing in the background there. Ain't going nowhere. You're right. So, it's not so maybe that's so maybe this is Henderson. Or I guess it could be Mouse too. Grab it. Oh, that's true. This is a much lazier vibe than Antigua. But he's still doing some of those same background slides behind. She may be. Oh, yeah. That walk down he did forever. Oh, uh, Oh, man, I just had something I wanted to ask you, and now it's gone. All right, well, I have to clear up one thing because this has confused me for a long time and I've heard a couple different stories. I know the correct way to, to say it is Louis Armstrong. Why do so many people say Louis and why is it wrong? From the expert go. <laughs> yeah, I, I could not give a definitive statement on that, but I would, I would have to like refer you to, refer you to Ricky Riccardi's blog which is dippermouth.blogspot.com. He's, he's a wonderful author. He okay. wrote a book specifically on Lewis and the All-Stars that was very useful to me in doing the project. Mm, right. But he, yeah, but he's a uh, wonderful writer. And he, he doubtless has, has a dedicated post, at least one about that. <laughs> so Lewis preferred Lewis himself, but but was fine and tolerated Louis as well. Yeah. I, he seems to tolerate a lot of things that he didn't necessarily have to. Sure. Yeah. I, I think that's almost his kind of, at least in my mind, one of his defining personality characteristics is he was just he was welcoming to whatever wanted right. to happen, and he, he was not he wasn't going to give up his ground at all. But he always welcomed people into his land, and I thought that yeah, was very really wonderful. Very accepting. It's it's kind of a yes a yes and approach, you know. Mm -hmm. Really nice. and, and you know, I, I look at this picture and we have all the talk about whether or not he really was this joyful all the time or whether this was kind of a performance space and, and I think either way, just listening to, if you take the face away, he still loves what he does. Oh yeah. And, and, and like his singing and his playing is so joyful, even on a sad tune like something like Black and Blue, like it's it feels celebratory to me, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There, um, so the Louis Armstrong House Museum, you might have seen, they they shared some footage, which was the first video footage of Louis live in a recording studio. Oh, wow. 
Wow. And uh, hold I didn't on a see second. this. That's that's about the same ending that he played at uh, at Town Hall. Too. Oh, cool, cool. Um, but this I was is saying, Tiger Rag, the last <clears throat> tune on this side. Yeah. Um, but if you check out that studio footage, um, you know it's I. You know it wasn't wasn't televised or anything, and you would assume that it was just Lewis being himself, like not in front of the public eye, even though he presumably knew he was being filmed. But he's just so, still so ebullient, so like, uh, like doing what what people would incorrectly call just mugging or something. But his his face is just lit up. He's mm. smiling and laughing while he performs. It's it's amazing. Oh, that's great. I'll have to look that up. You said that was the museum that released that. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I know we've actually, I think, touched on it a couple times, but I don't know if we've said it by name. Uh, the, the Louis Armstrong project that you took on was a, a recreation project, if you will, of uh, a, a handful of the Louis Armstrong All-Stars two that you performed at Lindy Focus last year. Uh, and you just released it on Bandcamp. It's for sale now. It's really excellent. Uh, and Thank you. Laura Winley and Jim Ziegler do a great job with the vocals. I was listening to it this morning again just to kind of get warmed up for it. And, remember. and, and they have that same joy that Lewis had. I, I, was, I think so. Yeah, it's really nice. And it's wonderful that they have, you know, Jim and Laura both have their, their distinct and very strong musical personalities that, yes. <laughs> that reflect, you know, their senses of humor as, as people. And it's, and it's nice also to have to have them on that project and not uh, and not you know some individuals who may have just tried to do imitations like really close imitations of right. Lewis and Velma Middleton. Well, and I think that that's that's what's always hard about those recreation projects is yeah. it is towing that line between how much do we copy and how much do we make it our own in the spirit of what we're doing and, and I think. Yeah. I think what you all did at Lindy Focus and what the, the Jonathan's Orchestra and, and the rest of that project has done has done a really great job with not trying to be a, 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 a copy, copy, note for note, act for act thing, but a really tasteful version of it. It's always really nice to see what everybody throws into it. And I think yeah. Laura yelling Lucian's name on stage is just so darling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I tried to help orchestrate a few of those, a couple of those moments. Nice. Okay. Sorry, I get distracted on drum solos. Yeah, Town Hall, this was kind of a drum feature song. Got it. Now, I know, uh, I know Danny Barcelona was Lewis's drummer for a long time. I've seen a bunch of his drum solos and on other things. Uh, yeah. I don't know when he joined, but Jimmy Crawford is also just one of those like swing drummers people don't talk about, but was kind of in a bunch of things you don't know. If that makes sense, or in a thing, yeah. in a lot of things you know but don't know he's in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great player. <laughs> and there we go. Drum solos are always so hard for me because <laughs> there, there's so much skill and little things that go behind it that one, you can't hear, and two, it, it's so hard to break down what's actually happening on these recordings because the recordings of all the different drums aren't that distinct. Yeah, yeah. Uh. It's great to have people like Josh Palazzo on your recordings so you can hear it more clearly. <laughs> yeah, oh, nice. Super cool. Um, that's so that's great. that's the end of side one. Uh, we'll we'll take a short break and we'll come back. But just before we do, 
Um, check out the Louis Armstrong All Stars Project. What's the official title of it? Because I don't want to say it wrong. <laughs> it's a tribute to Louis Armstrong and his All Stars live at Lindy Focus. There we go. Go check it out. Pick it up on Bandcamp. Um, I think is it available on your website as well or somewhere else? There are links on my website as well, which is just Gordon Al, which is A-U, GordonAlMusic.com. Perfect. So we'll, uh, we'll take a short break and we'll come back with side two. Thanks, Gordon. This is great. Thank you. All right.